October 16, 1996. The Oval Office, early 1964. The debate concerns over the Secret Service. You can find out whose morale's low and get rid of some of the bitches. I've got all of it I want to take. A first lady critiquing her husband's press conference. During the statement, you were a little breathless, and there was too much looking down. In general, I'd say uh, it was uh, a good B+. Plus. And looming large, the dilemma of Vietnam. I don't know what we can do. Uh, what alternatives do we have then? We're not, we're not going to send uh, our troops in there, are we? Tonight, the LBJ tapes, eavesdropping on history. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. It is especially on nights like this when we hear and see our leading politicians engaging in public debate, rehashing their well-rehearsed positions, that you wonder what they say and how they act in private. We're going to provide just such an insight to a former president tonight. It was not publicly known until long after he left the White House, but Lyndon Johnson, like John Kennedy before him, and Richard Nixon, who would follow him, LBJ had his phone conversations in the Oval Office taped for posterity. We've played some of those conversations on this program before. The Johnson Library has just released a new batch, and they are vintage Johnson. Part bully, part charmer, always calculating the angles and worrying about the press, often crude and manipulative, a little paranoid, but a towering figure, impossible to ignore. This first conversation that we're going to play for you is a perfect example. It's important to remember the time. It is January 6th, 1964. The Kennedy assassination, which elevated Johnson to the presidency, occurred a mere six weeks back. Johnson, who had always been sensitive about his image and popularity compared to that of Kennedy, had received a memo from someone he described as one of Kennedy's top people alerting him to low morale within the Secret Service. Listen to how Johnson dealt with the issue in this conversation with James Rowley, then head of the Secret Service. I think you better get all the men assigned to the White House detail together. Yes, sir. And uh, tell them to quit their belly aching, or if they don't want to handle the president, I'll get to send up an amendment to get the FBI to do it. I've got all of it I want to take. And I've got a note here tonight that... Uh, uh, they're greatly alarmed that the morale is very low, that a number of them won't transfer, and that it's a great body of men, and uh, uh, that we're going to need them badly in the campaign. But uh, they feel like that the president shouldn't ever uh, correct them, uh, either in private or in public. I know that you don't like to have your men referred to that way, but I'd much rather sever the connection and be glad to if any of them are unhappy. I think they're damn well paid. But there's a good many of them that uh, uh, could uh, improve themselves, and I have never bitched about it. But if they're going to bellyache, well, we'll just see which one could be the most effective belly. Well, I, I wasn't aware of that, Mr. President, quite frankly. That's all news to me. Well, you better get on top of it, call them all in, see which one of them wants to bellyache and get rid of him. And if they want to clean up their operation, all right. If they don't, well, I'll ask Edgar Hoover to sign me some men to go with them in. And let you all go back to handling that counterfeit. Yes, sir. Okay. Nor did Johnson spare the feelings of another Secret Service agent, Rufus Youngblood, who had literally thrown himself on top of Johnson in Dallas to protect LBJ when the bullets started flying. Youngblood begins by asking about that memo. If I may ask, sir, who, who if I may ask. Uh, I don't think I ought to do that, but one of Kennedy's top people, and somebody's been delegating him. And there's enough truth in it to, that somebody talks. And I can't have this lawyer in. I can't talk in front of people and have them repeat it. Well, you're absolutely right. You, you cannot have this lawyer in. I don't want any transfer, reassignment, any other damn thing, sir. You can find out whose morale is low and get rid of the son of the day. I, I, don't, I don't want any of it. I think now's a good time after Dallas to, to make a change if they want to do it. Now, I thought I did pretty well after Dallas. I thought I reflected credit on Secret Service. 
I did my damnedest to compliment you and everybody else, but if the appreciation I get is going to be the articles like this, Kennedy people come in and tell me that uh, their morale is at the lowest in the history. Well, I'm not going to be run by them, you know that. Uh, I do know it, sir. You get a hold of Rowley and you all see who the hell's in belly aching and get it straightened out and take the resignation, get them out of here, and get Lem Johns back, and you and Lem Johns handle him, you can handle me safer than 40 can, because they are liabilities to the asset. And if you all don't want to do it, just, just honestly say so, and I'll get you a good assignment, and I'll get Hoover to send me a couple of 21-year-old accountants over here and probably do as good a job. No, we, we'll stay with you, sir. Okay. By March of 64, congressional hearings were about to begin on what had happened to security in Dallas. And Johnson appears concerned that he will be smothered in security personnel. He does not want to convey an image of being overly worried about such matters. The head of the Secret Service, James Rowley, is again on the phone. Jim. Yes, sir. I want to report of the number of people that signed to Kennedy when he, the day he died, the number signed to me now, and if mine are not less, I want them less right quick. Yes, sir. And if I can't ever go to the bathroom, I won't go. I promise you I won't go anywhere. I'll just stay right behind these black gates. But I don't need eight people following me to church. And, uh, uh, one man, Secret Service driving, one in the car with me, and maybe two or three behind me is all right. But uh, uh, yesterday you had six or seven up in there. And, and uh, Walter Troyan has got a column this morning saying that because I turned out the lights, you had to increase your security. Well, that's so. Of course it's not so, but I want the figures. And uh, these boys that need jobs, put them to counterfeiting or something else, because uh, uh, if you don't do it, I'll commit suicide. When we come back, the issue is Vietnam, which consumed Johnson from the first and ultimately drove him from the White House. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Visa. For years, I dreamed of seeing Venice with my boyfriend, Tom. I'd whisper about palazzo as gondolas. All he'd talk about is deadlines and business meetings. Finally, I went and booked two romantic weeks on the Grand Canal with my Visa Gold card. Tom was completely surprised. Tom? Visa Gold. <laughs> Purchase power to make dreams come true. It's everywhere you want to be. In a Saab 9000 Aero with 225 turbocharged horses, you could have serious fun. You could feel the rush of torque. And when Automobile Magazine says you must drive this car, you could admire their keen grasp of the obvious. The Saab 9000 Aero. Find your own road. Saab. They're on their way to the World Series. Everyone loves a comeback, and these guys came back from the bottom. Doc and Straw, their amazing story, Turning Point, Thursday. They've already expanded the death penalty for drug kingpins, passed welfare reform with work requirements, forced teen mothers to stay in school or lose benefits. President Clinton and Al Gore. And for the future, balance the budget to grow the economy, create jobs, drug testing for felons, strengthen school anti-drug programs, Dole Gingrich stood in the way, and now all Dole offers are personal attacks. No ideas for our future. President Clinton and Al Gore, meeting our challenges, protecting our values. When the alarm goes off... And I wake up and go about my day. I don't even think about my feet. During one part of my day. I think seriously about my feet. I remember the selection of Just for Feet. Nike Air Max, Asics GT 2010. Nike Air Max Tailwind. Adidas Response Trail. Saucony 3D Good Hurricane. All at Just for Feet. For anybody serious about running. Serious about their feet. So in that one moment... When it all comes together... And once again... You don't even think about your feet. Find the newest, hottest styles for running. This week at Just for Feet, where your 13th pair is free. At a time when many Americans confuse Oliver Stone's artistry as a filmmaker with actual history, it can be especially useful to listen to tape recordings from early in Lyndon Johnson's presidency. Far from displaying any eagerness to get deeply involved in Vietnam, Johnson is principally concerned about not doing anything that will hurt his chances to be elected in the fall of 1964. As for what he will do beyond that, he wants options, clear, simple options. 
In this conversation of March 2nd, 1964, he's talking to Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. I want you to dictate to me uh, a memorandum, a couple of pages, uh, four-letter words and short sentences, several paragraphs so I can read it and study it and commit it to memory. Not for the purpose of using it now, I'd like for you to say that there are several courses that could be followed. We could send our own uh, divisions in there and our own Marines in there and they could start attacking the lead to the Vietcom and the results that would likely flow from that. Mm -hmm. uh, we could uh, come out of there and say we're willing to neutralize, let them uh, neutralize South Vietnam and let uh, the communists take North Vietnam. As soon as we get out, they could uh, swallow up South Vietnam and that would go. Or we could uh, pull out and say to hell with you, we're gonna have Fortress America, we're going home. And that would mean that, uh, that here's what had happened in Thailand, and here's what had happened in the Philippines, and come on back, get us back to Honolulu. Or we can uh, say this is the Vietnamese War, and they've got 200,000 men, and they're untrained, and we've got to bring their morale up, and they have nothing really to fight for because of the type of government they've had. We can put in socially conscious people and try to get them to improve their their own government and the, what the people get out of their own government we can train them how to fight and that uh, after considering all of these it seems that uh, the latter offers the best alternative for america to follow lyndon johnson was especially concerned about the care and feeding of influential journalists in washington not that he actually took their advice but he wanted them to think that he did in this conversation with National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy, the focus is a particularly hawkish columnist by the name of Joe Alsop. Mr. President, I've got a lunch with Joe Alsop. You got any messages for him? No, except uh, I think I, I'll just stay I, away from Vietnam. I think he really wants to have a little old war out there. And, uh, well, I'd ask him what his program is. I just. Uh, I'd ask him if he wants to send people in there and start another career. He didn't say the other day in his column. No, he he just said that uh, it's really going to wreck me, but I'd like to tell him we'd like to have his recommendation. Following a meeting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Johnson again talked with his National Security Advisor, McGeorge Bundy. The Chiefs had apparently pushed for some clear guidance from the new president. He, however, wanted to bide his time until after the election in November. They say get in and get out, yeah. and I told them, uh, let's uh, try to find an amendment. That will, uh, we haven't got any Congress that will go with us, and we haven't got any mothers that will go with us in the war. And in nine months, I'm just an inherited, I'm a trustee, i got to win an election, or next one somebody else has. And then uh, uh, you can make a decision, but in the meantime, let's see if we can't find enough things to do to keep them off base. Joining me now is Michael Beschloss, an historian who specializes in the U.S. presidency. He's writing a book on Lyndon Johnson's first year as president and has been listening to those just-released LBJ tapes. I'm fascinated by that conversation he had with McNamara, where he is laying out what really do sound like all the, the viable options. Is it your impression that he sincerely had not made up his own mind at that point? I think he sincerely had not made up his mind. Johnson at that point knew that he didn't really know enough. He had only been in office three or four months. His expertise had not been in foreign policy. At the same time, it was politically useful for him to delay a decision. He had to run for election in November of 1964. He very much wanted to put this issue on ice. He also wanted to position himself at the center. Didn't want to be called soft on communism. And at the same time, he did not want to seem too hawkish and have to explain to Americans why they should get involved in a war during an election campaign, probably the most difficult time to do something like that. Because one of the great controversies about Johnson has always been, was he responsible for the big buildup and was, something, was that something he had intended all along, even while he was still vice president? That sure is the view of Oliver Stone and some others, and I think it really isn't borne out by these tapes. 
What you see is a president who I think is genuinely asking for advice of various kinds and asking for options. One of the things that you see in these tapes is Johnson is essentially saying, let's have a review of all this. He knows that that will also serve him in not causing him to have to make any hard choices probably before November. Michael, when we come back, we'll hear some classic Lyndon Johnson strong arming. <coughs> Shoo, vermin. I am Fifth Avenue. And even though I live amongst debutantes and celebrities, things are dull. Oh, look, another tourist. Is there no relief from this monotony? What's this? The all-new ES-300. The road is calling. Answer it. Ah, something worthy of my asphalt. This is the Pentium processor. Inside the PC, that runs the CD-ROM that lets you plan a vacation by taking a virtual tour. And since it is a connected CD-ROM, it hooks to a related website through your PC's internet link. So you can go online to book a hotel, which makes you happy that you have a Pentium processor. Tomorrow, complete coverage and reactions to the presidential debate, plus World Series-bound Yankee manager Joe Torre. That's tomorrow on Good Morning America. Nelson reunion? Uh, straight ahead. Presenting a new family of cars for 1997. From a new era at Mitsubishi. Nelson family? It truly is a wide-ranging collection of automobiles. Nelson family. Up. Straight ahead. Everything from red-hot sports cars and rugged adventurous sport utility vehicles. Nelson reunion? To sophisticated and refined new sedans. They're great new cars for everyone. Because no two people are... Don't tell me. Nelson reunion? Exactly alike. New family of cars for 1997. From Mitsubishi, built for living. Art Gordon was completely out of touch with the ordinary person when he voted to give himself a raise of uh, $40,000. Bart Gordon has voted to raise my taxes 40 times. Bart Gordon betrayed senior citizens when he voted for a tax on Social Security. He talks down home conservative here, votes low down liberal in Washington. There was a war that Lyndon Johnson was determined to launch. Had it not been for Vietnam, he might have gone down most prominently in history, this one time senator from Texas, as the president who did the most for the poor and the victims of racial injustice. He had decided, for example, to wage a war on poverty, and he knew just whom he wanted as his field commander. Sergeant Shriver, director of the Peace Corps, brother-in-law to the late President Kennedy. As you'll hear, Shriver was not initially enthusiastic, but when Johnson had made up his mind, he was a force of nature, not to be denied. Mark. Good morning, Mr. President. How are you? I'm going to announce your appointment at press conference. What press conference? Sir, no. Oh, God, I think it, uh, it would be uh, advisable, if you don't mind, if uh, I could have uh, uh, this weekend, I wanted to sit down with a couple of people and see what we could get in the way of some sort of a plan. Because what happens, at least my thought is that what happens is that you, you announce somebody or hear somebody else, and they don't know what the hell they're doing or what the program's going to be specifically, and who's going to carry it. Then you're, you're in a hell of a hole because wait, wait. you start calling up and saying, well, now, what are you going to do? Well... And all that, you well, uh, just don't talk to them. Just go away and go to King David. Figure it out. We need something to, to save the press. Could you just say that you've asked me to study this? No, I don't know why. They've studied and studied and studied. They want to know who in the hell is going to do this, and it's leaked all over the papers for two weeks, that you're going to do it, and they, they'll be shooting me with questions. They've already done it. Shriver wanted to focus all his efforts on the Peace Corps. To Johnson, that was a part-time job which Shriver could handle in his spare time. 
But I'm talking about the man that is evolving the organization and in charge of perfecting it right now. And his name is Sergeant Thriver, and uh, uh, he still has his identification with the Peace Corps, and he will keep it to such extent as he as it deems desirable. And uh, if you can't run a hundred million program in your left hand and a billion with your right hand, you're not as smart as I think you are. <laughs> By the end of that day, Shriver and Johnson had their fourth conversation. What little argument there had been was effectively over. Now it was time for a little massaging. Johnson read Shriver a wire service story on the announcement, periodically adding his own sly commentary. Johnson said Shriver would take a hand in both the formulation and the execution of the war on poverty, would work closely with the cabinet committee composed of department heads and might be involved in the projected effort, projected effort. By naming Shriver's presidential session, John seemed to rule out, at least to the president, the idea of creating a separate new agency to handle the anti-poverty program. I don't at all. Johnson described Shriver as eminently qualified and said the Peace Corps director, brother-in-law of the late president, was outstanding qualities of leadership. God almighty, I wish I could buy that kind of advertisement. Now what you do is you've got to get together and see how in the hell you're going to administer this thing. Then you're going to have to get that bill and that message together, then you're going to have to get up to that Congress and walk it through. Yeah. And uh, you got to get on that television and start explaining it. And uh, got to get this advisory committee in and see that every damn thing that can be done for poverty is done. So uh, you just uh, you just uh, call up the folk, tell them you may not be at church every morning on time, but you're going to be working for the good of humanity yeah joining me once again historian michael beschloss vintage johnson isn't it he was really the incarnation of the man who would never take no for an answer in any case as shriver found the other thing that's interesting ted is you look at these hidden agenda shriver was trying to wriggle away because there was no staff for this war on poverty poverty at that point no budget he knew that the whole thing could collapse and could collapse on his reputation in Johnson's case, Johnson in 64 was very eager to keep John Kennedy's entourage on his side. Robert Kennedy, brother of the late president, was already beginning to have conflicts with LBJ. Johnson felt that it would be an awfully good thing to have the late president's brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, in his pocket. The other half of this, though, Michael, is that uh, there's sort of a what-might-have-been quality about that conversation. Had Vietnam not intervened, this was a president who really was committed to civil rights and doing something about the poor in this country. That's what he really wanted to do, and his whole effort on Vietnam at this point and also as 1964 unfolds is basically to get Vietnam sort of taken care of as an issue so that he doesn't have to think about it too much, isn't going to be criticized, and spend most of his time on the things that he really does want to do, which are just what you mentioned. But, you know, he tells another aide during this period he feels as if Vietnam is grabbing him by the ankles and dragging him down. As ultimately it did. Michael Beschloss, thanks very much. In a moment, a rare private telephone conversation between the president and his wife. I have now been off the Nicotrol patch for exactly one month. Using the Nicotrol patch, there was only the one dosage. And that made it very simple to use. You didn't have to worry about different phases and different steps that you had to go through. New Nicotrol, a whole new and simple way to help you quit. Only Nicotrol has a six-week program, not 10 weeks like the other patch or 12 weeks like the gum. I didn't stop. I've quit. And to stop is momentarily. To quit is for good. And that's what I've done. Six weeks, one step. Take control with Nicotrol. Leaves aren't the only thing falling. It's Sears Day, so prices are falling all through the store. It only happens twice a year. Top name brands at our lowest prices, like this Kenmore gas range with sealed burners for just $399.99. Or this self-cleaning electric model for just $349.99. Save on home fitness, too. Our Space Saver 2-horsepower treadmills, just $394.99. So get to Sears Days for our lowest prices of the season and rake in the savings before October 26th. What? What? Yeah. What if my kids need shots? What if I get transferred to another city? What if I need to lose some weight? What if I need an x-ray? What if I need a new doctor? What if my baby comes early? What if I need blood? What if I break my arm? What if there were a healthcare organization with such innovative solutions to what you might need tomorrow that all you'd have to do is enjoy today? What if my brother makes me a bug? What if you didn't have to worry about healthcare? Blue Cross. 
Blue Shield. A fast rising reporter. I can give Sadie ratings to die for. A high powered producer. Your job is to make me happy. In the talk show world, you get the story or get out. I want a killer show. You're tearing me to pieces! Well, I'm concerned about what could happen to her. You're going soft on me. It could make her career. Oh my god, is she overdosing? Jimmy, call 911! Or get someone killed. You crossed a line when you paid off for a penny. If you've ever watched a talk show, you must see this movie. Talk to me, ABC Sunday. Country driving. It's fancy coat time. Ooh, it's the football team. Your beauty queen. It's why we're right nearby. Load the gang up for this weekend's ball game in a Remy Dodge caravan. But reserve early, because these babies go fast. With an accomplished and forceful first lady like Hillary Rodham Clinton and an equally able and polished performer like Elizabeth Dole before us these days, it's a little difficult to remember the demure and retiring image favored by Lady Bird Johnson who was a tough, smart businesswoman in her own right. This tape from March 7th, 1964, offers a glimpse of her in the role of political advisor. LBJ had just completed a televised press conference from the White House. You want to listen for about one minute to uh, yes, uh, my critique, or would you rather wait till Yes, ma'am. I'm willing now. Um, I thought that you looked strong, firm, and like a reliable guy. Your looks uh, were splendid. The close-ups were much better than the distance ones. Well, you can't get them to do it. Uh, well, well, I would say this. They were more close-ups than they were distance ones. Uh, during the statement, you were a little breathless, and there was too much looking down, and I think it was a little too fast. Not enough change of pace. A uh, drop in voice at the end of sentence. Um... There was a considerable pickup in drama and interest when the questioning began. Uh, your voice was not noticeably better and your facial expression was noticeably better. Um, every now and then you need a good, crisp answer for change of pace, and therefore I was very glad when you answered one man, uh, the answer to, uh, is no to both of your questions. Uh, I think the outstanding things were that the close-ups were excellent. Uh, you uh, need to learn when you're going to have a prepared text, you need to uh, 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 have the opportunity to study it a little bit more and to read it with a little more uh, conviction and interest and change of pace. Uh, well, the trouble you... is that they criticize you for taking so much time. They want to use it all for questions. Then their questions don't produce any news. If they don't give them news, they catch hell. So my problem was trying to get through before 10 minutes, and I still ran 10 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. And I took a third of it for the questions, and I could have taken, if I'd read it like I wanted to, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know what to cut out. Mm -hmm. I believe if I'd had that choice, I would have said, uh, uh, use uh, 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 13 minutes or 14 uh, for the statement. Um, in general, I'd say uh, it was uh, a good B+. Plus. They would have recognized that side of Lady Bird Johnson back in Austin, Texas, where she ran the family's broadcasting business, but that was not the image of the First Lady known to the general public. She apparently was one of the few people in the world who could grade LBJ, evaluate his performance, and actually expect him to sit still and listen. And that's our report for tonight. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, GOP vice presidential candidate Jack Kemp talks about tonight's debate and where the campaign is heading in the final weeks. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. Nightline is a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source.